journey, but so many facing breast cancer have to overcome the burdens of cost and fear alone. No one should face breast cancer alone. Today, NBCF has provided over 1 million early detection and patient navigation services so that women in need have access to these potentially life-saving resources. To learn what every woman needs to know about breast cancer, visit NBCF.org. Uh-huh, yeah. Hey, check it out. I'm going to need you to turn up your volume. No, no, no. I'm supposed to say that. Come on. Hey, look, check it out. It's your guy, DJ Steph, the saucy man himself. Tune into It's Saucy, where I play nothing but hip-hop and reggae music. One, two, three, hit me. Wednesday nights at 10 p.m. on The Voice of Nassau Community College on 90.3 WHPC. Listen! When you're making a decision as a consumer, the most important thing is trust, which is why the BBB <laughs> is such an important tool. BBB! Sometimes a new company will generate a lot of buzz, <laughs> but that doesn't mean they're trustworthy. <laughs> there are places that pretend they're treating you like kings, <laughs> while behind the scenes they're making you look like a clown. But with BBB, if you spot false advertising, they're there to help you blow the whistle. Or if you've got a complaint, file it with the BBB and they can actually help you get it resolved. Test your advertising IQ. Go to bbbadtruth.org. You are listening to Beyond the Game on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I am Jacob Volk. Sitting across from me, Brandon Johnson, Dominic Arbolino, and Eric Fischetti. And we are fortunate enough to be joined by Ron Gerard, the author of A Game of Moments. Baseball greats remember highlights of their careers. Ron, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well, Jacob and uh, and Dominic and uh, you got a you got a house full over there. I'm getting triple. <laughs> yeah. It's like a church choir here. We're above fire capacity. <laughs> All right. Well, go ahead. Shoot away. Bring it on. All right. What can you tell us about your interview with Gary Carter? Geez, that's an, it, it, it strikes me as it shocks me that you would pick that name out of all Really? Of all because names. I'm on Long Island and the Mets are, what, like 20 minutes from here, no traffic? <laughs> yeah, I guess. Okay. Yeah, I remember when uh, speaking with uh, Jerry Carter, outstanding Hall of Famer, uh, catcher was very, uh, very uh, compelling uh, guy, to, guy to talk to. And, uh, you know, he, he would, uh, it was a number, of course, a number of years ago that I spoke with him. I don't remember every particular thing. You have to read the, the interview. But uh, he, was, he was a very interesting guy. And, of course, the highlight is him. Uh, uh, he had that, he labored for a long time, you know, in, uh, in Montreal with the Expos. And uh, he got a chance to go to the World Series with the Mets, and uh, you know that 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 moment for him, you know that that was his moment to, to to play on a World Championship club, and he was very grateful for that. You know, I remember him. He's a very uh, he's a man of great faith, and that comes out. It came out in everything that it, that it seemed that, that that he said, and and the way he lived his his life. He was. Uh, he was an inspirational type guy. He talked about being called the kid. I remember uh, they, they gave him that nickname because he was that enthusiastic, not only when he was a kid, but, you know, he was a veteran player, but he still had that enthusiasm about him. And that's what I remember the most about Gary Carter. Okay. Can you lay out for us your interview with Jerry Coleman? Jerry Coleman. Yes. Uh, great second baseman for, for, for the Yankees. And... Uh, he, uh, of course, later on went on to uh, to become like kind of a, a well, not kind of. He was a legendary announcer uh, for the San Diego Padres. Uh, he coined that phrase, "Oh, doctor!" You know, hear him go, "Oh, doctor!" You know, when somebody had hit one out. But he was uh, he was a very, very uh, in- intelligent uh, uh, man, uh, not only on the field, but I think uh, you know in life he was. Uh, a, a guy that uh, that was a fighter pilot in in and served in uh, in in World War II and Korea, I believe, and flew. I can't remember how many missions. Uh, it was a very courageous guy, and uh, I think that uh, I remember one thing that he said, and it's in the interview about when he came back. I said, "How did it change you going into a an atmosphere or in, into a war, and then coming back to play baseball?" And he said, "Well." Yeah, a lot of the teammates, you know, he noticed when he first came back, they'd all be 
yelling, come on, we got to win this thing, we got to do this. And he thought uh, at that time when he first came back, what the hell's so important about this, you know, winning this? Because he said, I've seen, I saw guys that were killed and everything. So it put everything in perspective uh, for him. But then I think uh, you get back into it. Uh, I'm, I'm a Vietnam veteran, and I know that at first it affects you to a certain extent, but then, then you, you, you kind of fall back into uh, being like like everybody else, and I guess you take certain things for granted, but that, that's life, you know? You can't always live it uh, at this fevered pitch. All right, But so, he was a very nice, very nice gentleman. He was a wonderful man. All right, so uh, would you be able to describe to us your interview with Joe DiMaggio? Well, you know, actually, uh, that I didn't speak with Joe DiMaggio. Uh, I think what was mentioned in there was... Uh, that uh, I used a photograph of Joe DiMaggio, and it's in the front of the it's in the front of the book, and it was taken June sixth, nineteen forty, by my father, who uh, was at Yankee Stadium. It was just a game against the White Sox that the Yankees lost, in, incidentally. But uh, it, it was Joe standing there with a bat and and a glove in one hand and the bat in the other, resting on the ground. And I said to my father, "How did you?" How did he wasn't a professional photographer at that point? He was later in life. I said, "How did you get a, a DiMaggio to stand there and take a picture?" And uh, he just said, "Well, he was he was coming in from the outfield and uh, uh, and after batting practice." And I, I I just said, "Hey, Joe, can I have a picture?" And he took it. I think he took it with an old uh, box camera that he had, and that picture hung in my house, a small a little small print that he made. Uh, uh, of Joe DiMaggio, and it hung in the house for years and years. It was like like you'd have a me- a member of your family or something, you know. And that's <laughs> what I think it probably brought a lot of my interests out in baseball. I I thought I was going to be another Joe D, <laughs> but I found out uh, pretty quickly <laughs> that it's not that easy. And uh, I was not in the mold of a Joe DiMaggio. I don't think Marilyn Monroe would go for you, Ron. <laughs> well, I don't know. I had several letters from her, and I don't want to get involved. Ooh, in wow. Nice. Do you still have them? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just oh, joking man. around. But, uh, <laughs> no. Joe, was, uh, Joe was the man. He was a good-looking guy, and he was a great athlete. And, uh, you know, you think about that night, uh, that 56-game uh, hit streak, it just, I, I just, it's hard for me. There's so many records fall, but it's very difficult for me to imagine that, uh, that somebody will break that. I'm not saying they could never do it, but it's an incredible, incredible uh, accomplishment on his part. I mean, along with the many other things that he did, but that just stands out. It was incredible. I guess the whole nation was riveted on every time that uh, Jolt and Joe went up to bat to see if he could extend the streak. I mean, DiMaggio was an amazing athlete, and just in my time playing Little League Baseball, I always played center field in war number five because of him. He's been, you know, that much of an influence on me. But what can you tell us about your interview with Don Drysdale? Don Drysdale, I spoke with, uh, I believe I spoke with him in, uh, in, in Cleveland, believe it or not. Uh, he was a White Sox announcer for a while, but uh, he was a very interesting guy, very friendly, very nice guy. He was an intimidating force on the mound, of course. Uh, and uh, we talked about uh, he and Sandy Koufax. You know, a lot of people, you know, they were on the same pitching staff. And at the time when they were at their peak, a lot, many people speculated in the media also that they didn't get along very well. And uh, he, he told me that, uh, that that wasn't true. You know, it just kind of things get out there or somebody starts a rumor or whatever and it catches fire and it kind of blows around for a while. But uh, he was uh, he was a very good friend of Koufax. I think they both went in the service at the same time together also. But uh, he talked about the intimidation factor uh, uh, of, you know, he, he never dug in too much against the Don Drysdale because he wasn't afraid. He said that that inner part of the plate was my territory. Hmm. And uh, he said, I'm going to back people out of there. So, uh, and that leads me into something uh, that uh, Bob Gibson, one of the great pitchers, along with Drysdale, that's in the book, uh, one of his a guy that was traded from the Cardinals uh, was playing against them. And after the game, I guess they saw each other uh, out in the parking lot or somewhere. And the guy, and this uh, teammate, I can't remember who he was, said to, said to Gibson, he said, uh, God, Bob, you, you almost hit me when I was up there. And Gibson said, no, I, I didn't almost hit you. He said, if I wanted to hit you, I'd have hit you. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> he had the control. You know, the guy had, had good control. And uh, 
Uh, you know, 1968 was Bob Gibson's, uh, you know, uh, signature year. Talking to Ron Gerard, the author of A Game of Moments, baseball greats remember highlights of their careers. So can you lay out for us your interview with Monty Irvin? Yeah, Monty Irvin was at a uh, was in Pittsburgh. They were honoring uh, the uh, former Negro League players that played with the Pittsburgh Crawfords and also the Homestead Grays, both uh, out of Pittsburgh and uh, retiring numbers and putting a flag that uh, uh, out in uh, center field or up in you know up there. So uh, for forever, I guess they have it over at uh, PNC Park now. Also, this was a Three River Stadium when I spoke with him. But uh, it, uh, he spoke about the uh, about, of course, the New York Giants and and Willie Mays, uh, who we kind of mentored uh, there with the Giants. Uh, but I, I think uh, what it, what sticks with me mostly about him is the uh, the uh, Negro Leagues, and he talks and he and he was so passionate about it, talking about the the great players, and I remember how we. I remember, it, it, they don't all use your name, but he remembered my name. He said, oh, Ron, if you could have seen these players, he said, they were such outstanding athletes and uh, uh, dynamic players uh, playing playing in the Negro Leagues, like Josh Gibson, you know, and uh, Buck O'Neill, so many great players that they had. And he was paying tribute to them. And, of course, he, he played there also. And... Uh, Many people thought that, that he would have been the guy to break the color barrier, the color line, when Jackie Robinson did back in 1947. But uh, they, I think Monty Irvin was a, number, a couple years older, and they thought he was maybe too old to try to, do, to, try to be a trailblazer in that regard. And they took, uh, there were many reasons for, for Jackie Robinson, I'm sure. You know, <laughs> the guy is a legend. But uh, Monty Irvin was mentioned at one point that they thought he would be the, uh, the guy to do it. Wow, very interesting. Would you, able, would you be able to describe to us your interview with Ralph Kinner? Kiner. Oh, Kiner. Oh, oh Ralph me. Kiner, oh. yes. Uh, of course, anybody on Long Island now and uh, in New York remembers Ralph Kiner as the Mets announcer for, I, I guess, it when it had to be uh, around 50 years or more that he was with the Mets from their inception in 1962. He and Lindsey Nelson and Bob Murphy, and uh, he talked about, uh, you know, uh, being in the booth and uh, so forth uh, with the uh, with the Mets, they had a show they called Kiner's Corner. You know, I'm a homeboy because I lived for uh, my grade school years in Valley Stream. So uh, I know where you guys are in case I get annoyed with this uh, with this interview. <laughs> I, know, I know Garden City very well. I'll come down there. I, oh, I'll come go down catch an explain. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he, he spoke about... Uh, Kiner spoke about, uh, of course, being a player. He was a he was a great home run hitter. He had a shortened career because he had back problems, but he he had a tremendous percentage of uh, uh, of home runs. I think it was maybe second to Ruth, or it might have even been not 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 over as long as Babe Ruth. But uh, the the percentage of home runs uh, per year and game uh, were was way up there and. Uh, Kiner, uh, of course, played most of his career with the Pittsburgh Pirates when they didn't have, they were not a competitive team at all. And uh, I remember he, he said about Branch Rickey, who was a general manager, who incidentally brought Jackie Robinson uh, to the Dodgers. He was then with the, with Brooklyn. But when he was with Pittsburgh, uh, Kiner had hit, uh, I think, like 50-some home runs one year and came in, and they wanted to give him a cut in pay. And... Uh, uh, Kiner said, well, Mr. Ricky, he said, look at all the home runs I hit and the, and the RBIs that I had compared to other years, and you give me a pay cut. And he said, I'm going to ask you something, son. He said, where did we finish last year? And he said, well, we finished last. And he said, well, we can we finish last with you. We can finish last without you. Sign the contract <laughs> or get out of here. But that's the type of, you know, that was the atmosphere back then. That's until, you know, until the players and the players' union came in and started uh, looking out for the players themselves. So uh, what can you tell us about your interview with Bob Lemon? Bob Lemon uh, was very, very laid back, Bob, Bob Lemon. He was uh, a really nice guy. Uh, of course, it was, it, it, everyone in New York remembers him as the, uh, as the manager of the, uh, of the Yankees there between Billy Martin's stints, you know, in New York. 
But uh, Lemon was uh, was an outfielder originally. Talked about that. Had a good arm.